Hi, my name is Babatunde Lee, and I'm a professional musician and uh, a drummer, percussionist, band leader, and producer, and educator. And um, I was hired as one of the principal composers of the Moad Suite. I'm Greg Landau. I'm one of the composer producers of the Moad Suite. And uh, I've been a music producer, musician, historian, and educator. I've done a lot of music production in Latin America, especially in Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, and, and Mexico. Hello, my name's John Greenham. I'm a mastering engineer by trade. I was responsible for uh, the recording of the piece, and I also worked on the editing and, and so forth like that, making it sound good, basically. The Moad Suite is um, music that is chronicling the travels of African people from where they traveled and were taken um, from Africa to all points west. Well, the, first of all, we, we had to come up with a concept. We had to write the piece on paper with words, which is very difficult because it's something that we usually don't do. I was imagining a big sound that we, we started calling the ohm sound of you know things coming up out of that and we had voices and, and, and ambient sounds coming up out of, that, um, out of that big ohm because that's what it was like. A, I was thinking of it as a time machine that would take, take us forward um, into the different places that African people had traveled. And, and, and if you listen to the Moad Suite, you will hear that uh, rising and swelling. There's a big mmm like that and, and, and it would herald the new movement. It became clear that um, there was going to be, it was the music was going to play on the staircase. So then the challenge is how to uh, write the music so that it wouldn't clash with the thing that was on the next level. And so therefore it all had to be at the same tempo and it all had to be in the same key. What I did was, being that it had to be in the same key, um, I used a bilophone. Uh, um, uh, which is an Af a West African instrument. It's like a xylophone. So it's actually it's the prototype of the xylophone and the vibes. You know, it's, it, that's its roots there in West Africa. And the balafon, that's B A L A F O N. And uh, so I co composed all the music on that. Also, using suggestions from Ollie Wilson, one of the great musicologists of, of the United States and, and composer of of modern African-American music, he suggested that one of the commonalities between all these styles of music was one rhythm. And we tried to incorporate that. We used that as the basis of all the different pieces. Mm -hmm. So we use this, this rhythm that appears in blues, in jazz, in reggae, in hip hop, uh, in many of the Afro-Cuban and Caribbean styles. So we use that as a link to be able to make these fit together because it's not about the, only about the same key and the same tempo, but it has to be in clave. It has to be in the same rhythmic phrasing so that the, these things fit together. Yeah, we sort of had an idea of how it might sound <clears throat> you know, before we recorded it, but um, relied heavily on the uh, miracle of modern technology to overlap pieces, the digital technology, digital, digital workstations and so forth. Otherwise, impossible, really, you know, to, to blend those those different things together. The first movement origin starts uh, with water and and a a pygmy chant that was recorded at Hyde Street Studios in San Francisco, and then uh, opens with a. Uh, the a song to Elegua, the gatekeeper, and this is the traditional in the Yoruba tradition. This is the song that opens any ceremony. This is the the song to the gatekeeper to open these gates, uh, to open up people to this to the spiritual world, and to get blessings from from Elegua. And then we go to another chant, the other chant of the movement, um, where we had Bobby Cespedes singing to Yemaya, which is the god goddess of the ocean. And that was when we were getting ready to, to travel across uh, the ocean. And that was where Yemaya helped a great many Africans make it and receive the souls and spirits 
spirits of a great many Africans uh, that didn't make it. In, in her also, her rendition of the chant to Yemaya, she brings in elements of gospel music, and she's also showing the transition as people are making the crossing, the cultural transformation that begins to happen as they reach the new world, as they're hearing new voices, learning a new language, uh, hearing new musical sounds, and also their language is being taken away from them. And so that her in her rendition of it, she brings in another... Uh, element here, uh, again, showing this transition. The second movement, where where the last movement, um, where Origin ended up, was with Bobby singing this Janta Yemaya, and then we went into the beginning of movement, and we brought uh, Dwight Tribble, a well-known and, and renowned jazz vocalist, and who has this great, big, beautiful voice, and and I composed a spiritual for him to sing. And, and it's talking about how he didn't want to leave Africa. And that is the beginning of landing on these on the shores, on the Western shores. Uh, uh, is That's the first thing you hear is um, his voice. And that's the beginning of um, gos- spirituals and gospel and the blues and jazz. And, we, and that's where we go, we go from each one of those genres from out of Dwight Tribble's voice. The th- third movement was the probably the most difficult because this was talking about the period of the 60s and 70s and we were focusing on how these different uh, styles of, of African-American music transitioned into pop music. And this is one of the, the things that we tried to contrast was the the, the the shallowness of the of this pop music that evolved, in contrast to the the times that were so violent and the, and the discussions and the deep poetry that was coming out of the neighborhoods and communities. It begins uh, with a with a duop, and actually it has, has it's just the vocal part of it, and along with that um, we have some voices of uh, some political voices and pertinent voices of of that time. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and, and many others, voices coming in there that kind of give people a feeling of, of the, the, the crisis that was going on in society and, and the social and political movements that were fueling and pushing these musical f- uh, forces forward. That was uh, um, very meaningful to me because I lived that, you know. I was raised in New York and New Jersey, and like I was saying, I... I lived on 166th Street in Amsterdam, which was the same street that the Audubon Ballroom was on um, that Malcolm X was killed in. And I went to the Apollo all the time. You know, the Apollo was a a mecca in those days. And I saw everybody from Ray Charles to Bobby Blue Bland to Betty Carter to Sandman Sims to Marvin Gaye to The Spinners, The Temptations, James Brown. I, I saw them all. This part also captures the, the different communities. So we hear the R&B and the doo-wop and the funk, but we also hear Afro-Cuban music that evolves in Harlem, in Spanish Harlem, in the same time in many of the same players that played in one style would play in another, and how the uh, the African diaspora evolved in the Caribbean also, and how all these things came together in New York. So uh, we tried to show that playing a cha-cha-cha uh, next to an R&B piece going into a funk piece we called Power to the People that, that showed the Black Panther Party. For me personally, I mean, I didn't grow up in this country, so I'm at somewhat of a disadvantage with having first-hand experience of all these things, but it's, you know, what comes across is a very, very turbulent time, but very difficult, I think. And there was the adaptation of, of African peoples who have come from, gone from slavery into um, mainstream America and, and the crucial and painful journey of adapting into a society 
that wasn't really welcoming you with opening open arms, you know. It's, it's my contention that we still haven't been debriefed from slavery. Adaptation is really a step in that direction, is to sh shine light on, on, on our journey and what we're doing. And that's why it was so meaningful for me to work on that, to be part of that, to, to spotlight what, what was happening, because there was a lot of tragedy as well as um, triumph, you know, the triumph of the spirit um, that makes us still be here and relatively sane <laughs> and, uh, and doing phenomenal things. Transformation is, is, is really going into modern times and, and present times and the use of electronics and, and the digitizing of a lot of music today. But it also <laughs> begins with kind of the, the beginning of, the, of this uh, more global culture of, of, of one culture feeding off another, the, the electronic media allowing people to, to hear things now much more quickly and people borrowing from one place to another. So we have voices of, of people chanting in the streets of Mexico and Peru mm -hmm. and an Afro-Cuban ceremony and some hip hoppers in New York and all these different elements coming together. And we're trying to show how the, this new style of music that, that begins to evolve brings in all these disparate pieces of the African diaspora into one genre one piece. Some of the pieces we brought back, we brought back the, the spiritual, the gospel, we brought back the blues, mm -hmm. uh, we brought back some of the Afro-Cuban elements, some of the African drumming styles, or, or at least suggesting them. And again, looking at the ways that these DJs and MCs began talking about their own history and world history by going back and grabbing these little pieces of, of other cultures, of other sounds and textures to try to explain who they are, where they came from, uh, the, the, with this new palette of tools that they had, the scratchers and the turntables, transforming uh, technology into instruments. What for me is important is that, yes, this is a transformation, but we need more transformation and hopes this stimulates and inspires even greater transformation.